Good morning. Today we are going to discuss Lesson 16. Let me begin with a quick recap from last time. Last time we were starting to focus on the idea of matrix inverses. So I want to remind you, let's let V be the collection of n tuples and W be the collection of n tuples. We'll also denote beta and gamma as the standard bases of these vector spaces. So perhaps I'll give a very quick example. It's just the collection of tuples x, y, consists of where e1 is simply this vector 1, 0, and e is this vector 0. Okay. <clears throat> now, I want to define a linear transformation that's very standard. Let's say that A is an M by N matrix. So visually, we can write A in the following form. So here I'm just writing out the A We always set this so that M is the number of rows and N is the number of columns. Okay. So once we have such a matrix, we can then find a linear transformation as follows. this L sub A going from Fn to Fm. And we'll find this via left multiplication. Very explicitly, if we think of as the following in tuple then l a of x which of course is just the product of this matrix we can write out in terms of the So again, for example, this here will be the second column. So quite literally, LA here is just defined as F multiplication by A. So once we have this, then we said that we had a few facts. So number one, with respect to these bases, the 
I can consider the matrix representation of left multiplication by A. And we actually just recover this matrix A. Second remark, this is more of the definition. We'll define the length of A. And remember that this is simply defined as the dimension of the range of this linear transformation. So again, we want to think of LA as a linear transformation, and we want to think of A as a matrix. They are not really the same. One is a rule that says, given a vector, I can write down a new vector. The other one is simply an array of numbers. But this array of numbers really tells us everything we need in order to write down the rule. Now, there were a couple of statements that gave us properties. So in the text, these are theorems 3, 3, and 3, 4. So as always, let's fix an M by N matrix A. So here's the first of the three statements. A if and only if both n equals n. So this gives us a numerical criteria for determining when A is invertible. Number two, let's say that perhaps A some linear transformation T. I already saw that this is the case if I specifically look at a standard basis and this left multiplication by A. But this says over here, let's just say that we have So maybe there's some linear transformation that matches up to A. It doesn't have to be LA. It could be another one. Then, they're the same. So it doesn't matter. If I compute the rank, then I know what this matrix A is. And here's the third result. Let's say, perhaps, that a matrix B is P, A, Q for some invertible M by M matrix P and an invertible N by M matrix Q. All right, so P is invertible, Q is invertible. Then again, the ranks are the same. So with this third result here, we actually saw a couple of things. First, if A and B are similar, then they have the same rank. In fact, 
if B is obtained from A by an elementary operation, So that is by some elementary matrix operation. Then again, they have the same rank. So these were all of the results that we had from Monday. Now today, I want to focus on a couple of very simple motivating questions. So first motivating question says, given a matrix, how do we actually compute its rank? So far, we haven't really seen any numerical examples. We just know that we have these fancy theorems that say, in order to compute the rank, whatever this integer is, we have to look at this subspace and then compute the dimension of this subspace. But today, I want to focus a little bit more on how do we actually numerically compute this. Second question is, remember that the goal is to find another matrix where when we multiply things together, we get back the identity. So that is, let's say, let's assume m equals n. Saying that a is invertible, there is an n by n major. which I'll write as a to the minus 1, such that a times a to the minus 1 is equal to a to the minus 1 times a, which is equal to the n by n identity matrix. So simple question. How do we actually find a to the minus 1? So just because we know that A is invertible, that was the first part of this theorem above, we still haven't talked about how do we actually compute this here. This is something we'll come back to probably after the first midterm. So today, I want to focus a little bit more on this whole question here. So how do we compute the rank? So this is our first big theorem of the day. So I'm going to start with this theorem 3-6 from the book, which goes as follows. Let's say for the moment that an M by N matrix A has rank R. So let's just say by some method, I've a I'm able to compute this rank. So what do I know about R? Well, it's a couple of things. Number one, R is not too big. So this says here that R cannot be more than the number of rows, and R cannot be more than the number of columns. All right, so remember I said back over here, M is the number of rows, N is the number of columns. So again, the rank R cannot be too big. second statement here is a little bit more along the lines of this part three, and this says there exist invertible 
m by m matrices b and n by n matrices c such that this matrix that I'll call D, which is B, A, C, now looks something like this. So here what I've done is I've kind of blocked off this matrix. It's a diagonal matrix, but I have R1s here at the top, and I have N minus R zeros here at the bottom. All right, so I'll write that this way. So here we have R ones, and then here we have N minus R zeros. So again, we'll find here a matrix that's a diagonal matrix, and I have R ones here, then I have N minus R zeros down here. R here is the rank of the matrix. There's a third result that we're going to use quite a bit. And this goes as follows. Both A and its transpose. Which I'll write this is A to the P, have the same rank. So, what I mean by that is if R is the rank of A, it's also the rank of A transpose. So, let me perhaps just remind you what do I mean by the transpose here? IJ entry of A is then the transpose right this is A to the T is that in whose IJ entry is A I. Perhaps let me give a quick example of this. That may be our matrix A in this form here. And this here is a two matrix Of course, this here has two rows and three columns. one of the columns would be this here. Then the transpose, this matrix, where now the rows become columns. So this two matrix has three rows and, and you can see this first column switched around so that it now becomes the first row. All right, so this is what I mean by the trend. So the whole point here is that whatever the rank of this matrix is here, 
this one below has the same rank. Now what I'd like to do is at least sketch a little bit behind why these states are true. I'll leave the details, but at least I'd like to sketch a little. Now, the first statement, I'm not really going to worry about, but I want to come down here and at least show the second statement. Now, to show the second statement, let me set up some notation as follows. First, this is beta. As the standard basis of Fn, let's denote gamma. as the basis of Fm. And I'm going to construct two bases, which I will call a prime. So again, I have my beta and gamma, and now I'm going to tell you how to construct beta prime and gamma prime. Simply put, I will construct beta prime and gamma prime the way that we did this on homework assignment number four. So really, I'm going to write out really the solutions from last week's homework set. Right. So let's write this be as a series of classes. So first, what we'll do is, let's consider the following. Let's consider the image of our basis, beta. So this is the image of our basis beta. Well, we know that this is spanned by some set. Sorry. This So again, I'm looking at the span of the set here. This has bases. Let's call this F. So half has elements W, W, R. And without loss of generality, we may choose each of these W's 
one of these here. Right, so what's happening here is I take a look at the span of the set that some sub. I only pull out the first R of these, and then the rest of them I don't really care about for the moment. And again, here, because R is the dimension of the range. Of course, the range is exactly the span here. If I want this here to be the dimension, then that means here I have to have R elements in this set. So this R here is going to be the rank of A. So once I have this set here, then I know that I can extend this to a basis. That is to a basis for W. And very explicitly, let's call this basis gamma prime. and we'll write it out this way here. Sort of start with a basis for the range, and then I'll extend that to a basis for the whole space step. So you may remember that this was one of the tricks for homework assignment number four. Now, I've explained what beta is, I've explained what gamma is, I've explained what gamma prime is, so I need to tell you what is beta prime. So let's define beta prime as follows. So here I'll write u1 through un. So first, let's write our, sorry, this here should be v. Let's write our vi, or b, i. If I goes up to R, or I'm going to write this in a weird way, but be I minus thing. Be minus this here. If I is a little larger. Where I need to tell you where these A1, A1i, A2i through ARI come from. So here, I need to look at what happens with EI. Remember that here, I'm only looking at the first R elements in this set. But what about the last ones? So this is true. Now I go R plus U all the way up through N. So again, what I'm saying here is, if I take a look at the N elements of this set, the first R I will put over here. Because this set now is a basis for this span, then everything else, the different ones that are left, all have to be a linear combination of the first one. Right, so again, you may remember that this was the trick for the homework, homework assignment number four. So once we have this, then we can make a couple of claims. So the first claim is beta prime is a basis for V. All right, so you may remember that this is something that you did on the homework. The second claim, now let's take a look at what happens when I try to apply LA to each of these elements here. 
So either LA on EI is WI, or LA is zero. The first part here comes from this definition. Because remember that my, sorry, this here should be VI. Because my first VIs are the EIs, and the EIs now just VIs. However, the latter ones are where I have to take a look at this definition. And now when I apply LI to this, then from this relation here, I see that I get something to step back to zero. So here, this is now the zero vector. So I know quite a lot here about So once I see this, then here I'll write my third claim. So now let's take a look at this matrix here. So here now, I'm taking a look at this transformation with respect to this, beta, this basis gamma prime and this other basis here, beta prime. Well, remember for homework assignment number four, we showed that we have now a diagonal matrix where we have R1s and n minus r zeros. So again, this here is a diagonal matrix. Where here we have r ones, and down here we have n minus r zeros. So again, if you're wondering where this is from, these three statements here were what were on homework assignment number four. Right. So we have quite a bit already. We have our basis beta, our new basis beta prime, we have our basis gamma, we have our new basis gamma prime, and we know something about this matrix. So putting all of this together, let me focus on the following diagram. Here I want to consider V, which is Fn. Here I write another V which is Fn, here I'll write W, which is Fm, and then here I'll write a W a second time, which is Fm. Now recall that we have this idea of this standard representation. And there's a couple of standard representations that I care about. One will be with respect to beta, and the other is with respect to beta prime. Similarly here for W, I have a standard representation with respect to gamma, and I have another standard representation with respect to gamma prime. Now with these four, I have a few maps that I care about. One map is here this left multiplication by A. And remember, everything is set up so that with respect to the standard bases, which we're calling beta and gamma, this here at the bottom is quite literally the matrix A. Now what about the other two? Well, for this here, let me consider the identity transformation. So it just says, let's say, V to V. So what's here at the bottom, I will give a name. And this is simply what I get if I look at the identity transformation, but now have the spaces from beta prime to beta. You may recall a few days ago, we considered this to be the change of coordinate matrix. I'll write something very similar over here. Here we have now the identity map on W, 
And here, let's consider a matrix B, which is what we get by now going from, say, the basis gamma to the basis gamma prime. So here I have my three matrices C, this is a change of basis matrix A, which is the matrix we started with, and then B over here, this will be another change of basis matrix. Now, let's put together everything we know. Number one, C and B are both invertible. The inverse is what we get by simply interchanging the basis. Right? You may remember that we actually stated this a few days ago. Next. B is also invertible. Where it's the inverse, the same concept, we're just going to interchange the bases. Right. Next claim, let's denote D as this matrix we got from the claim up above. So this matrix D, we actually know quite a lot about. D is for diagonal, it's the diagonal matrix. We know how many ones, how many zeros we have. Now in order to compute D, I simply have to take a look at the composition. So D says, start over here with respect to beta prime and end up over here with respect to gamma prime. So we actually see that D here, be the product of these matrices. So remember, we always read right to left. So it should be C, then A, then B. So I'll write this from right to left. C, then A, then B. But of course, this is exactly what we wanted to prove. Right? So again, if you really wanted to know how the proof of this goes, it really comes down to this diagram here. So we have our standard bases, beta and gamma. We now take a look at, say, this new basis, beta prime, that kind of comes from the homework assignment. We have this other basis over here, gamma prime, that comes from being very careful about the range and extending a basis. And now we just look at the composition of these three, and we say that this is where the matrix D is coming from. Now let me just make a quick remark, since I'm not going to worry about the proof of statement three here. And notice here, D is BAC, and the point is, B and C are invertible. So again, because B and C are invertible, the rank of A is equal to the rank of D. this proposition, right? As long as B and C are invertible, then I know what the rank of D is. On the other hand, the rank of D is simply the dimension of the range.
And you can convince yourself that if you really take a look at the range here, what's actually happening is that we have to take a look at how many elements are here in this basis. But really, that's simply the number of ones that we have here on this diagonal. So we'll simply write it this way. The rank of this matrix is the number of ones we have along the diagonal. So simply put, if we want to compute the rank, we have to compute this matrix here, D, and then ask how many ones we have. I said it here in words. To compute the rank R, we must compute D and the number of ones. So this we're going to come back to. Right, so somehow what we need to do is figure out how to compute this matrix D. So in a sense, compute these really clever bases, beta prime and gamma prime. We we'll then just count the number of ones we have. And then that will tell us what the rank of A is. So that we're going to come back to. The last thing I'd like to do for the day is to turn a little bit to the composition of functions. I want to ask a very basic question. Let's say that we have two matrices. Let's say by n So it should be an n matrix. Right, it should be by n. And let's say that I'll come back and I'll re do a retake here. Something's wrong. All right. Okay. Let's try this again. The last thing I'd like to do for the day is just answer a question about compositions of transformations. So let me ask a motivating question. Let's say that A is a that B is a P by M matrix. So then we know that this product B times is a P by N matrix. So we have a very simple question. If I know the rank of A and I know the rank of B, what can I say about the rank of B times A? So again, if I know something about the rank of A, know something about the rank of B, what can I say about the rank of B? So that's where I'd like to end today. 
some discussions about this. So this here is theorem 3.7 from the book. So it tells us something about composition of functions. So again, just like before, let's say that we have an m by n and a p by m. So again, m by n matrix and b by m matrix. that the product B times A is a P by N matrix. So the statement is that I have so this says the rank of B times A is not more than the rank of A and moreover the rank of B times A is not more than the rank of B. All right, so the rank of A and the rank of B somehow give us upper bounds on the rank of the product. That's the first of the two statements, so let me write the second one here. In a slightly more general sense, let's say that we have two linear transformations. T here mapping from V to W, and let's say that U perhaps mapping from W to Z. These are linear transformations. Between finite dimensional vector spaces. In this class, everything's finite dimensional, so we don't have to worry about it too much, but just say that you have two transformations here. Then I'm gonna write down exactly the same statement, but now for linear transformations. So the first says that the rank of the composition, U compose T, is not more than the rank of T. And the second says that the rank of the composition is not more than the rank of u. Right. <clears throat> so I'd like to get the proofs of these. And then, of course, we're going to use these statements a bit later on in the course. So let's start by showing the first one. The way we're going to do this is let's consider the following diagram. So here I'm going to write down Fn. Here's Fm. And here's Fp. So I actually have a couple of linear transformations. I have a map that, say, takes x to, let's call this u, which is a times x. Right? So quite literally, left multiplication by a. And then the second map here, this to b times u. Right? So just multiplies on the left by b. Now, of course, what the composition does times b is it takes x, to, sorry, not a times, times a times x. 
right? So have a left multiplication by A, left multiplication by B, or the here, multiplication by B times A. So here's how we prove the first one. Let's start here at the top with the rank of B times A. Now we know to begin with that this is the dimension of the range of left multiplication by BA. So again, this is by definition. Right. The definition of the rank is simply the dimension of this space. Now on the other hand, we know that this dimension is bounded above by this dimension. And this here is because the range of left multiplication by BA is contained in the range of left multiplication by B. Well, here's the idea. It's actually very easy to see it here. Take an element over here that's in the range of left multiplication by BA. That is in this form here, BA times X. But this here is in the form B times U, which means it's really in the range of left multiplication by B. Right, so again, if I have something over here that's in this form, it's in the range of left multiplication by BA, it must be in this form, which means it's in the range of left multiplication by B. So that's why I have a containment here. And of course, if you have containment of vector spaces, one is the subspace of the other, you have the statement here about the dimensions. So that we also prove. But the here is equal to the dimension of B, all right, the rank of B. And again, this is by definition. So this is why we have the rank of BA is less than or equal to the rank of B. Right, so this here more or less comes from this picture. Now let's try to do the other direction. For this one here, we actually need to use the previous theorem we just proved. So now let's take a look at this. The rank of BA. Well, this is actually equal to the rank of this transpose. Again, remember that the rank of A is equal to the rank of B. So I'll just put in the transpose here. This is also equal to This here is going to take the transpose of a product, then actually things get moved around. So the transpose of B times A is actually A transpose times B transpose. Right? That's not meant to be obvious. That you have to play around with a little bit, but the order then switched. I'm just kind of showing. that the rank here is less than or equal to the rank here. So this is by the previous statement. Right, so again, we said that the rank of B times A is less than or equal to the rank of B. So we're just using pretty much the same statement here. And this here, of course, is equal to the rank of A. And this is because the rank of A is equal to the rank of A transpose. This is the statement we made here. So this shows the first statement. So the rank of BA is less than or equal to the rank of A. The rank of BA is less than or equal to the rank of B. So now 
on the show the second. This is actually not hard at all because we've already done all of the hard work. So for this one, we'll do everything very simple. Let's choose babies. Let's choose the basis beta. for W, and let's choose a basis alpha for Z. All right, so we have these two transformations, P and U. I'll just fix, say, just these three bases, beta, gamma, alpha. Once we do this, let's make the following definitions. So let's denote the matrix A, which is what we get by looking at And let's look at the matrix B, which we get by changing U from gamma to alpha. And then, of course, we can place all of this into a diagram so we can make sure that we know what we're doing. So here's B, here's W, here's Z, here's Fn, here's Fm, here's Fp. And remember that we have these standard representations with respect to the Alpha. So here we have the transformation B. Bunch of here at the top we have a transformation U, and we know here at the bottom that'll correspond to a matrix B. All right. So we just are simply write this down and just do a quick chase around the arrows. So let's prove the first of these two inequalities. We want to compute the rank of this composition. And we know now that that's the rank Remember that this here is by a previous theorem. Remember that if this here is the matrix for some linear transformation, then the rank of this matrix is just the rank of that transformation. That was the theorem that we actually stated at the end of the last lecture. Now this here, of course, is just the same the rank of BA, and this is because this matrix here, this composition, is actually the product of these two matrices. All right, so you can see that by looking at the matrix representation for the composition, and that should be the product of these two matrices here. So let's keep going. Now we know that this here is less than rank of A and of B. So then that means that it's at most the square of the two. All right, so I'll write that here. So this is because the rank is at most the rank of A. This is at most the rank of B. 
this notation here says pick the smaller of these two, and then whatever this is here, it's still smaller than that. Right? And if it's smaller than these, let's say if this one here is less than this one, well, this one here is still less than the smaller. Right? So that's the concept here. However, we already know of A and the rank of B. Are. And the rank of B is the rank of U. So again, the rank of A is the rank of T. And the rank of B is the rank of U. Remember, we proved this, at least stated this, at the end of the last lecture. And this is how I began today's lecture that these two ranks are equal, and therefore these two ranks are equal. But now this is exactly the statement of the proposition. Right, so now this is that the rank is less than this rank. The rank here of this composition is less than this rank. Okay. All right, thanks for listening.